guys. Um, welcome back once again to Chalk Talk with Big Ben. This is going to be the third episode, and it's going to be up sometime in this week. Obviously, it's if you're seeing it now, it's up. Yeah. Anyway, um, I had a lot of questions this last week, and so what I did is I decided to make two videos and split them up so I could answer each question and not have to cut any out. And so uh, let's get started. One two three B three N one twenty three. Hey man, can you explain in detail what one should be doing to generate the best leg drive? I think I remember you saying it's something you were working on and it looks to be paying off. You get loads in your bench fits. Um, thanks man. I, I appreciate you noticing that. I've definitely been working really hard on uh, fixing my bench. It's always been, I mean clearly it's my weakest lift and it needs the most work, um, both strength wise and technically. Um, and a lot of a lot of what I've been doing lately is trying to get my leg drive down and um, it's been hard especially like now that I am back at school in my wonderful um, dorm room again it's uh, it's really hard to to transition from using the benches that we were using back at uh, my home gym and now the lower bench is here but essentially what I'm trying to do <laughs> when I'm when I'm thinking about leg drive is keeping everything tight and then once I hit and I get ready to, to, to try to explode off my chest, um, it's like a leg extension, not like a leg press. I'm trying to kick my feet out. They're dug into the ground really hard, and I'm trying to push them out and push myself back. And if your back is tied into the bench and, you're, and you do it effectively and you extend out, it kind of gives you that little pop without letting your butt come up. And you'll see also in the videos, um, I have a few sets where my butt definitely comes up off the bench, and I'm trying to fix that but that's that's usually a result of me using the the wrong kind of leg drive so I'm gonna try to attach actually a video clip here and so I can show you an example of that so I hope it works alright so here I go I'm gonna take my own lift off I call that a lever lift off and once I touch they see my quads are flexing and I'm trying to push my feet out and push the bar back and so it's it's like an extension pushing everything back towards the rack Hopefully that worked. Okay, um, next question. Uh, Lechi Wondura. I was wondering if you can go into your diet. Uh, kind of. <laughs> right now, I am following a diet plan um, that my uh, good friend Adam and I came up with. Um, it has me eating about 10 meals a day, uh, trying, to, trying to maintain my body weight um, and just increase the at the same time increasing the volume of food that I'm taking in, if that makes sense. Uh, the 10 meals are spread out to help uh, keep my metabolism high so I can stay lean but still possibly put on a little bit of um, a little bit of weight. I'm, I'll link the diet to the bottom of this video so just check the description to actually see what I'm going to be eating for the next uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so, okay. Also can you expand on the importance of recovery, overtraining and such? I notice you typically add things to Shaco um, that work for you. Is this type of instinctive training learned after several years of training? I know some elite powerlifters, Pete Rubish and Chris Hickson, train by feel, um, using usually maxing out. How does one work up to this? Uh, start off with recovery. I think it's very important. I've noticed, especially in the last in the last few weeks, I've been taking a lot of extra time to focus on my active recovery, uh, in my hip mobility and stuff. Um, it's very important. I mean, your training is only going to be as good as your recovery is. If you're not recovering from the sessions, you go in, you can't, you can't perform. And so it's very important the time that you're taking outside the gym. Um, you just need to make sure it's solid. I, I foam roll every single night before I go to bed for at least 20 minutes to a half hour. And if that's too much time for someone to be able to give up, it's, you have to find ways to make it happen. I do that before I go to bed every single night. And I stretch and, um, you know, I take precautions to help cut down uh, with inflammation. I ice things. Uh, you just have to really take care of yourself, especially if you're lifting with the high volume frequency that I, that I generally do. Um, as for overtraining, if you're doing all that stuff, it, you know, it doesn't happen very often. And when it does, it's usually injury related, in my experience. If, you're, if you are legitimately overtrained, that means you are training to the point where your body cannot recover. Um, I just I just don't see it very often. I don't see I, I very rarely see anyone whose diet is on 100%. They're getting plenty of rest outside the gym, 
and they're legitimately overtrained where they're pushing so hard in the gym that they that, that they're doing too much. I just don't see it happening very often. So I'm, I know it can happen, but generally I would stay away from using that term because I, I feel like it falls under the excuse category a lot more often than it falls under the legitimate reason for backing off on something. Um, as for what I add to Shaco um, and the idea of using kind of a reactive training template, I say once you learn how to adjust things to your you know, you, you figure out your body after after using it a lot. And so the more experience you have, the better you learn what your body, body reacts to. And so the, the more you can, you know, pretty much play around and see what that what works and then implement that in other training forms. I run Shaco, but I don't run Shaco as written because I know there's certain things of it that don't, particularly help me because I've tried them before and they haven't helped me or I will add something in that I know really has a good carryover for me and so you, you just learn your body and I think it's interesting that you say um, when you're the examples you give uh, elite powerlifters Pete Rubish and Chris Hickson um, Pete and Chris and myself we're all pretty we're pretty young guys I mean you know we're all in our early 20s and so when you think about that it's it's also kind of ironic that we'd be the ones who are using a lot of this uh, kind of train by feel because we haven't been training for by as long as some of the guys who might be 30 or 40 and you know have been doing that. I also want to say that because we're younger, we can get away with um, with training harder and going all out every once in a while. Um, I know Pete hits a new max deadlift or tries to just about every week. And he's had some phenomenal gains. I, he he pulled 785 uh, recently. Just barely missed an 800 pound pull. Um, training with uh, Eric Lillibridge and Chris down there, at that at that place they train at. And so I mean, it's working for him. And so I would never ever say, don't do something if it's working. But I would say that that <laughs> results may not be typical for you know if it if that's not your way of getting better by maxing out every week, then don't max out every week. Learn your body, figure it out, apply those skills. Um, Matt is bored. For a meet, how much weight do you cut, and what's the heaviest you let yourself go before the cut? I don't like cutting weight at all. I hate the process of um, of doing a like a water dump where I'm losing. You know, I don't like swinging my body weight. I don't like getting into a meet and not being sure how much the weight loss is going to affect my my performance. And so I generally try to stay, you know, I compete at 198, um, usually between the 202 and the 208 range uh, when I'm just training regularly. I know coming up I'm going to be doing a meet that's um, that's a little bit, uh, the, there's only four weight classes, 175, 225, 275, and then the, the big guys. And so... Um, for that, I'm probably going to try to gain a little bit of weight, which is going to make my next cut a little bit harder, but that's something I'm dealing with, you know, as it is. I generally don't want to be any heavier than six pounds over the week before because I like to know where my strength's at at the weight that I'll be lifting at. And so I haven't had to struggle a whole lot with cutting weight because of that method, um, but I definitely don't enjoy... <laughs> I don't enjoy having to dump a lot of weight if I if I get out of control. So I keep everything pretty. I try to stay lean most of the time, and within you know, within a week or two away from making weight if I need it. Um, M. Matt, do you suggest programming in Olympic style squatting for a powerlifter? And if so, how should one go about it? I think I covered some of this in my last video, um, but I just want to hit on it again. Uh, generally, what I do for Olympic style squatting is squat how you're going to squat for a competition and then you can add it in as in like you can do it as a secondary lift uh, I liked it I like it a lot with deadlifts I think it really trains me to because a high bar Olympic squat you go down the first thing to go is usually the bar starts to go forward on you and you're you collapse a little bit so it really makes you build your lower back um, to you know and they can get really ugly really fast uh, also, if you would run like a, you know, run that as your main lift for like four or five weeks, I've heard there's a big carryover. I know Ben Seath's brother, Matt Seath, I was talking to him, and he, um, he runs 
uh, he'll run a five three one cycle of squat and use it use a high bar Olympic stance for that and he really enjoys the carryover he gets from that so it's definitely possible to keep it in um, your program even if you're a power lifter and that's not your normal form just you know listen to your body and see see if it's helping you if you're not getting anything out of it you go to that and you go back to your regular squats and they don't get any better maybe it's just not something for you to really worry about um, Sam McLaughlin uh, from T Nation I believe what do you study out of interest Okay, another, another one of those life questions. Um, currently, I'm in my fourth year here at Central Washington University, and I am a voice performance major. And what that means is um, classical music, and I'm in an a cappella group. Uh, we're called Nada Cantata. If you want to look up some of our videos, I might link one at the bottom of this, too, if you want to see. Um, but I sing. That's what I do. It's what I love. I love music. And I think it it's a lot of fun, and I'm going to keep doing it. So I study music. I'm in the Douglas Honors College here, which a lot of literature, a lot of philosophy, um, you know, uh, stuff like that. Not a whole lot of the, not a whole lot of math or any of that. That's not really, that's not really a strong suit for me. And then also I uh, am currently minoring in American Sign Language. So that's what I'm doing here at college. Um, yeah, Spar Four T. I think it would be cool if you would touch on being patient with reaching goals. And um, I saved this one for last because I think it's really important. I really want to want to drive a couple of points home with this. Um, I get I do get approached a lot by some some younger lifters who have who who just have so much that they want to do to to really excel at the sport. And I think it's very important for me to say it's it's important to be patient we don't all go the same speed as far as progress is and some people take a lot longer I took longer to you know I I had to work a lot harder <laughs> for a much longer period of time to get to where everyone else is, was at in high school um, personally so I know that I know the feeling of wanting something so bad and working so hard for it and not really seeing the results but I'll tell you right now, if you put in the time and you do it, you know, you put everything you have and invest in being better at what you're, whatever it is. It doesn't, it isn't just about lifting. It could be about, you know, it could be about whatever you're passionate about. If you really pursue that passion, no matter how, how much effort it takes, the effort does eventually pay off. And if you can, if you can accept that it might take longer for you than for some other people, you're gonna be okay. What you can't do is get is is get so frustrated with with struggling through something that that you give up on it. Because once no one no one ever gets better at something when they quit. And so if this is what you want to do, if lifting is is something that you are passionate about, go for it. Even if people tell you that that you're not gonna do anything with it. You know, my first my first powerlifting meet, I think I took seventh and was totally written off. It was like, oh well, he tried it, and you know, it, you just you start. We all start as beginners, and you go somewhere. And the more time you put into it, and the the more patient and consistent you can be with your goals, the better chance you have of actually achieving a success in in the thing you care about. So, please don't quit just because it doesn't work right away. The best things in life are the things you have to work the hardest for, and they're definitely the things that mean the most to you after you get them. So thank you guys again for um, watching this. Thanks for watching all these. Thanks for your questions. I'm already getting questions for the video that's going to be up on uh, Sunday or Monday. Um, thanks for keeping those up. Keep them coming. I appreciate it a lot. Train hard. Train smart. And I will talk to you guys soon.